Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Today on CityCast Boise, the Oscars are this weekend. I've seen every film nominated for Best Picture this year, and I've seen almost all of them at the flicks. Theater owner Carol Skinner is with me today, digging into the nominations and sharing what it took to open the iconic Boise institution 40 years ago. It's Wednesday, March 6. I'm Nick Kwa, and this is what Boise's talking about. Carol, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I, I love the flicks. Um, in many ways, it feels like a second home to me. Uh, I just want to sort of start off by thanking you for running this beautiful establishment. <laughs> well, you're so welcome. You know, I love doing this. And it's been, it was 39 years in September. So 39 older years. than you. Wow. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, actually quite a bit, by quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to go a little bit backwards. Like, what is... What is your own history of film? Uh, is it something that you fell in love with as a, as a child? What's what's your story there? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, I was raised in the Army, and all Army posts have movie theaters, bowling alleys, and roller, roller rinks. So I know how to do all three of those things. <laughs> but I really love the movies. So let me just say that I they didn't used to rate the movies when I was a kid. So you could see anything. And an early movie that I saw was Vertigo by Alfred Hitchcock. And I came home, and I think I was nine when I saw that. And I came home, and I said to my mom, you and Daddy have got to go see Vertigo. And she said, well, we are going to go to a movie tonight, but we're thinking about going to see Red Buttons in Tea House of the August Moon. So, And I was really frustrated with them. And 25 years later, they did a re-release and a big deal about Vertigo. And I called my parents when they lived in Olympia, and I said, so I just want you guys to know they're not doing a 25th anniversary of Tea House of the August Moon. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I just have always loved movies. Did you ever think about I don't know, joining the, the film business yourself or, you know, writing movies or something like that? Was it something that ever became an ambition of yours? You know, I like to write, and I do sometimes write short fiction and essays and stuff. And of course, I write the Flix film calendar with all those blurbs in it. <laughs> but I had an idea to write a screenplay. And I went one time to a screenplay writing workshop. Mm-hmm. It's so different from writing fiction, you know, because you have to understand everything. They walk into the room, the, you know, the director or the DP stands here. And they, it's, it's very detailed. It isn't like any other kind of writing. And because I have to pick what I spend my time on, I decided that maybe it wasn't for me after all. Right. <laughs> and acting, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I mean, you could have, you could have, uh, there's always the, the theater downtown. <laughs> I can read the variety headline now. Carol Skinner. She always plays herself. <laughs> <laughs> not not always a bad thing and not super uncommon, honestly. <laughs> uh, what, what did you end up doing before um, starting to flex? Um, I moved to Boise And I had worked in the dental office as the office manager for about 12 years. And I set up my own dental office consulting business because they don't teach dentists how to collect their money. (laughs) They just teach them how to do dentistry. (laughs) And I bought suits and a briefcase with my initials on it. This was in the the 70s? 80s. 80s. And then I was set up on a blind date with a guy. And we talked over lunch. And he said, what would you do if you weren't working with dental offices? And I said, I would open an art theater because I just moved here from Seattle where I could go to (laughs) all these different art films. And all you can see here are the blockbusters. And he said, oh, that's great because I want to open an art theater too. And I have the blueprints in my trunk. Would you like to see them? (laughs) And that was Rick Skinner, who I married less than a year later because I had said, can I help? And he really did need some help because... He was going to keep doing his day job. And movie theater isn't a hobby. No, absolutely not. It's a very hard business. Yeah, it is. I'm curious as to what the what the process is generally like. Because it's my understanding that you book all the movies. Uh, you're, you quite proudly booked all 10 of the best picture nominees this year. 
what does that process look like for you? Do you do you go out to film festivals? Are you talking to distributors all the time? Are you going to pre-screenings? Where does it start? So when we first started, things were really different because that was um, mm-hmm. 1984. And I uh, got phone numbers from different distributors and just called them up. Most of them were really great and, you know, gave advice on not just who had what movies, but how much not to pay. And, you know, I really I got to be friends on the phone with so many people. And then I would I would travel actually and go meet them in person too, um, and talk to them and have them get a sense of what we were doing because the Flix is unique in that not only are we playing movies, but we have a cafe and we have beer and wine and it's geared toward grown-ups. And not that we play quote unquote adult films, but we do play films for grown-ups. And so I got to know a lot of those people and they and they were really helpful. And you know, we we always went to the Seattle Film Festival. We started 35 years ago going to the Palm Springs Film Festival. We went to Sundance a couple of times. I went to Telluride, which was my absolute favorite. And I went there, oh, I think six times and got to meet a lot of the not just the directors and producers, but the stars are there. And it's a lot bigger festival now than it was then as far as how many people go. It used to feel like a summer camp for exhibitors and distributors. Hmm. And so you, there would be a party and, you, and everybody would be there that had a film there. And so that was really helpful to getting to see films there. Tell you right, so often and still does have a, a lot of the films that are going to be popular. They played All of Us Strangers. That was the first place they played. Yeah, I remember reading that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we sometimes um, have press screenings, but that's more for local critics and not for me because I will have already decided on the film. So four screens in the flicks right now. How many films do you sort of block out in the year usually? what? How many films are you sort of shopping for? Well, typically we, we are playing four films at a time. Sometimes we're playing five or six if we can share them so that they, we could hold them over longer. And the reason that we have four screens is we started out in 1984 with one screen and we quickly realized that you can't <laughs> hold a movie very long. If you have a dedicated audience like we do, they see the movie and you don't see them again till the next movie. So we added uh, screen number two and then we were able to play more films and hold them longer. And then in 97, we added theaters three and four. And so typically it's, a, it's at least, I mean, a hundred movies that we play. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sure in any given year, there's like the tension between um, a smaller film and a film that you know would probably sell tickets. How how do you sort of work through that choice, or do you purely go by gut uh, instinct? I mostly do go by what I want to see. Wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, if you have to decide some way, right? And so I'm not really as much of a numbers person. I probably should be, but. Uh, luckily, my husband has a good job, so we don't have to live off the money that we make from the flicks. Thank heaven, after the pandemic, that is no money. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we're, we're climbing our way out of that hole. I just feel like I have a broad enough taste that what I want to see is probably also what other people want to see. Yeah. Well, sometimes you'll see, you know, I used to say art, that we show art films, independent films, and foreign films, and now I add and curated Hollywood film. <laughs> I really want to see Barbie. Heck, you know, Oppenheimer. You know, those are movies that I don't want to go someplace else to see when I have my own movie theater. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code P-O-D. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Uh, You talked a bit about the pandemic earlier, and I'm curious as to... Like how, you know, the, the state of independent sort of movie chains is, is a little bit tough these days, uh, crawling out of the pandemic. And 
I feel like a lot, I read about even larger movie chains closing and, and shuttering locations. How is the Flix doing today, a couple of years into the sort of recovery from the pandemic? We're doing okay. We're, we've had a really good November, December, January, and February. Been really, really busy selling lots of food, lots of beer and wine, a lot of movie tickets. And I feel like we're out of the woods. I'm a little bit worried about what the directors and actors strikes will do going forward. But there's such a wealth of films and there are a lot of independent and foreign films that I have to say no to because we only have four screens. And so it's a little bit hard for me right now. Everyone's got something and they all want to bring back the Oscar nominees. And I'm just like, we have four screens. We we can't yeah. do all that. And so it's really kind of a feast or famine thing. We hope that going forward, you know, in the spring that things will still be okay, but we'll just have to see. So for right now, there's the um, the live action and animated shorts that you're going to be screening in, in one of those screens. Tell me a little bit about the selection this year, because I think the only one I've seen is is um, Wes Anderson's uh, Henry Sugar. Yeah, that's a big deal, isn't it? I really enjoyed it. And I and I tend to really enjoy shorts, even though they tend to gravitate towards the darker <laughs> most right, of the time, right. I think. Uh, what is the selection on offer this year? And what is your favorite of the, of the lot? Well, I haven't seen all of them. Um, and so I'm not going to I'm not going to guess who's going to win or which one is the best one. But I have to say that we have played those every year that they've been available. And it used to be that like 11 people would come, you know, <laughs> and now we sell them out. So it's pretty, it's pretty great to see that kind of transition where people love the shorts. There was one short film that wasn't animated that made me want to stop showing the shorts. It was so, I thought, harmful to the people whose family it was about. And it was made without their permission in Great Britain. Um, and I got a lot of pushback from people about that. And so I'm like, fine, we'll just make a big sign saying this is the Freddie one with a heart. <laughs> basically <laughs> if there wasn't any way I could edit that short out you know so this year um, I haven't previewed them and we always just say you know just because it's animation don't assume you can bring children I mean that's always the kind of uh, the the mistake that I think a lot of parents make because animation is not just Disney stuff right like it is yes it, it's it can get very visceral <laughs> and, you know it's funny because we used to always call we never used the word animation we used cartoon and cartoons mean kids. So but animated films don't necessarily mean kid movies. Right. So I'm thinking, I'm wondering what do you think about the the Oscars in general these these days? Because, you know, there's a sense that Hollywood is increasingly dependent on <laughs> superheroes, I you know, some intellectual properties, like stuff that, 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 that kind of feels really different from what cinema was celebrated for in the past. Uh, and also, I think I think there's an understanding that the Academy Awards as a tally cast has sort of declined in, in interest and in, in viewership over the past couple of years. Uh, do you think the Oscars are still a big deal? You know, I've watched the Oscars forever, so I still love the Oscars. And there are good years and bad years, and depending on, you know, what kind of stuff goes down on screen. Um, I have to tell you, because I think this is kind of cool, the first Oscars I remember, Miyoshi Yumeki won Best Actress for Sayonara, a movie that came out in 1957. Hmm. We were and we were living in Texas then, I remember. So um, the, I guess seven is the age when I really got into film. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as far as the Oscars now, I think it's fun to know, you know, who wins. I love it when they show the clips of the foreign, you know, best international film, best. You know, I like to see as many clips as I possibly can. I really like that. I really like it when they do in memoriam and they mention all the people that have passed away because it, hmm. you know, so many of, of the icons are are disappearing before our eyes. Right, it's a form of also just history, right? To to be able to see that memoriam in one place. Yeah, it just it's nostalgic for me, and it's also sometimes you didn't hear about somebody, someone's passing. I, I love the beginning because I love to see the gowns. <laughs> <laughs> the red carpet's part of the experience it's a wonderful thing <laughs> i have not addressed your question about the relevance i think it's not relevant for a lot of people it's you know but i'm glad that they expanded the best picture category to 10 films hmm. it used to just be five then i think it was eight for a little while yeah some years they've struggled to find eight or ten <laughs> right not this year though it's pretty pretty tight year this year is a tough year. I mean, of all the years to be nominated for an Oscar, this is probably not the year because the competition is really, really stiff, both for acting and, and for best film. Mm -hmm. Best picture this year. Who's going to win and who should win? Okay, that's that's a great question. I was saying all along, I've been saying Oppenheimer 
Christopher Nolan is someone that I feel like I discovered. We played his film Memento so long ago. Mm-hmm. And we played it. It was an art film. And we played it at the Flinks. It didn't play any place else in Boise. And then he got to be this huge thing, you know. And so I really liked Oppenheimer. And I thought it was going to win. And now I'm not so sure because uh, I have seen all of the movies. But when I saw Poor Things, my feeling is it's also a masterpiece. Yes. And it's completely different. And, you know, remember when everything, everywhere, all at once won. And people are like, what? That was so weird. But I think that doing something new and completely different is a great direction to take in the movie industry. And I kind of think that Poor Things will win. So you're saying that you think the Poor Things might take it this year? I think it's going to win. I do. Uh, will you be watching any Oscar parties? Oh, uh, do you have? A, would you be attending an, an Oscar watching party? I don't go to Oscar parties because people talk. You know, I 100% agree. I like watching it at home by myself. Home alone <laughs> is the way. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, very last question. Um, will you will you ever retire? What's the What's the future looking like for you? What's what are you? How are you thinking about that? I still love doing this, and I was meeting with a financial advisor not too long ago who said who asked me the very same questions, and what I said was, I don't know if I'm not the flicks lady, who am I? And she replied that so many people that retire don't face that fact that they that so much of their identity is wrapped up in their work. So I'm not done. I still love doing it. I now have um, Josie, who works, has worked for me for about 30 years, that's doing 75% of my work. And I'm mostly just doing the, the booking and some marketing and, you know, creating the film calendar. So as long as I can keep doing that, I'm going to do that because I think the flicks has so much to do with my taste and what I choose. Carol, thank you for so much for taking time to talk to me. I really, really enjoy learning all of this. Thank you, Nick. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe to our free Hey Boise newsletter for a cheat sheet to the city. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more local stories. See ya!